We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church family. Great to see all your faces here uh, on a Labor Day weekend. It's really e extra uh, blessing that you're here with us, not out doing something else. And so thank you for being here. My name is Matt. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I serve here at ACC as the lead pastor. And right now we are in week five of our series going through the book of Colossians, uh, which is awesome. I'm excited about that. I want to ask you to grab your copy of God's Word and open it up to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to finish out the chapter today and start the very first part of chapter 2. And while you're finding that, I want to, um, I want to tell you about a show that I used to watch as a kid. And it would come on right before bedtime when I was like in elementary school. I was a pretty young boy, and it was right before bedtime. The show would come on, and I, my parents didn't like me watching it before bedtime because I wouldn't sleep well if I watched this show. Now, I don't want to tell you what it is. What I want to do is play the, uh, the theme song for this. And if you know what it is, as soon as you know it, you can just raise your hand up in the air, but don't say it out loud, all right? Let's play just a little bit of it. Here's a, here's a better part, you ready? All right, let's cut it before our live feed goes down. All right, how many of you had your hand up? You knew what that was? As soon as I say it, the rest of you are like, ah, I know it, is a show called Unsolved Mysteries. Remember, they would, they, even just the, like the little video that they play at the very beginning was like really kind of spooky, and it was like they were trying to solve really unsolved mysteries. Mysteries that haven't been solved, and the, the host is kind of walking through these different things, and I just wouldn't sleep well after I watched Unsolved Mysteries. I love, though, I love the concept of a mystery. I love the, I'm the kind of guy that when an illusionist does a trick on stage, I, I'm the one who goes home afterwards and I spend like 12 hours on YouTube trying to figure out the solution to the trick. Anyone else like that? Like, I like to know the secret behind the mystery. I don't want mysteries to be unsolved I want to know the solution. I want to know how it works, right? And here's what I love about the passage of Scripture we're going to cover today. We're going to be looking at Colossians 1, verses 21, all the way through the third verse in the next chapter. And in this passage of Scripture, you're going to see words like mystery and secret and buried treasure. And you're also going to find uh, in uh, maybe like the ESV version, you might even have the word alien. And so I don't know about you, but when I think of like aliens and mysteries and secrets and buried treasure, it makes me want to sit on the edge of my seat and know the, the solution, right? I don't want unsolved mysteries. I want to know the answer. And so I hope you're excited as we go through this passage together. Uh, what I have found in this passage is four mysteries that Paul is essentially trying to unmystify, He's trying to give us the answer to these mysteries. All right, here's the first one. If you're taking notes this morning, write this down. It's the mystery of reconciliation. The mystery of reconciliation. Now, I know it's a long word, and you probably take the next five minutes to write it down in your notes. Uh, all of my words are pretty big today, and so write small in those blanks. All right, the mystery of reconciliation. What does this word even mean? Essentially, reconciliation means the repairing of a broken relationship. When your relationship with someone else is broken, maybe you've experienced this in your own life where you have, somebody's done something to you, or you've done something to someone, and you've worked hard to reconcile, to repair the brokenness in your relationship. Well, there's a mystery to this reconciliation that we're gonna talk about. Let me show you in Colossians 1, verse, starting in verse 21 and halfway through verse 22. It says, this includes you, who were once far away from God. Could you do me a favor, just so we can connect with this verse? If you were once far away from God, could you raise your hand? 
Right? That's, that's all of us, okay? This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled, there's our, that word, he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. It says that we have a, a broken relationship that's been restored, it's been repaired somehow because of the death of Jesus on the cross. Now, some of you are thinking, that's not mysterious. You know, I understand that. That's the gospel message. I've been in church. I know that. But I want you to think about it in, in maybe a new light. Let me give you a legal term to help us think about this word differently. The word restitution. Right? Restitution is a form of reconciliation. It's, it's a legal term. It's where... Uh, Two parties, one has wronged another, and there's some sort of financial compensation to try to make both parties whole again. And so an example of this would be if, uh, if somebody broke something of yours that you, was very valuable, like someone crashed into the side of your car, right? They would have to make it right. They would have to provide some, some money or repair it or do whatever it costs. That would be restitution in order to bring both parties back to where they were before. Or if somebody were to, maybe you were, uh, you caused because of your negligence, someone else to need some medical expenses. You see, restitution would be you paying uh, as the wrongdoer the bill for the victim so that they can be made whole again. Maybe somebody stole something from you, and the court system says, listen, you got to pay restitution. You got to pay back what you took so that you can put the, the victim back into the spot they were beforehand. But here's the deal with restitution. Every single time, it's the person who did something wrong having to make payment to put the person who was the victim back into the place they were before. That's how restitution works. Now imagine this for a moment, that somebody stole something from you, all right? You logged into your bank account, you see that someone logged into your account, and they took $1,000 out of your account. It's gone. They stole from you. And then the police call you tomorrow, and they say, hey, great news. We found the person responsible for the theft. Come on down. We want you to meet, uh, you know, so you're, you're there, and, and here, there's, this is what they say to you. Listen, in order to make things right... We need you to take another $1,000 and pay it to the person who stole $1,000 from you, just to, you know, for restitution. To make things right, we need the person who is wronged to pay the person who is the wrongdoer. That wouldn't make any sense to you, right? You would scratch your head and say, this isn't fair, this doesn't make sense, this is quite odd. And yet, this is the mystery of reconciliation. You see, according to Scripture, if we keep reading, let's look at this. The second part of verse 22, it says, As a result, he brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before God without a single fault. All of you have been reconciled back to God through Jesus, and, and through, through Jesus Christ, if you put your faith in him, you now stand before him faultless. Remember, this letter is written to believers. So if you're in this room right now and you're not a follower of Jesus, this doesn't quite apply to you, this passage. But for those of you who have put your faith in Jesus, it says, one day you'll stand before him completely reconciled, faultless, total restoration. Remember the show, uh, it hasn't been on for years, but it was a show on TLC when TLC actually meant something like the, the learning channel is what it was called. It was a show called Trading Spaces. Anybody ever see this show? The concept is one person, one family has like a master bedroom they would like to remodel, and another family has a living room that they'd like to remodel, and they trade spaces, and they trade spaces for, you know, about a week, I think, I don't know how many days, and they have like $1,000, and they remodel someone else's room. And it was always a bit of a disaster. Usually it didn't turn out well. It wasn't enough money, and they didn't understand what the other people wanted. It was kind of in, enjoyable to watch. Well, this is, the, this is the idea of ultimate reconciliation. We have Jesus, who, who's perfect, and you and I, who are not, 
And Jesus says, listen, through faith in me, we can trade spaces. You can have my perfection and be reconciled to the Father, and then I'll take your sin and pay for it through my death and, and burial. On the, I'll, I'll, through my death on the cross, I'm going to take care of your issue. It's incredible restitution, except the problem with it is that it's not the wrongdoer who's paying the price. It's the person who is wronged who's providing restitution to bring you reconciliation to God the Father. Makes you scratch your head a little bit. That's incredible in the mysteriousness of how is that even, how does that work? It goes on, it says in verse 23, but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. You know what I appreciate about this verse in a new way? When you see the mystery of reconciliation, you recognize why Paul is saying to the church in Colossae, hey, I want to encourage you not to, to forget about this. Don't, I, want to, I want to ask you to continue to believe this truth. Why would Paul need to remind a people to continue to believe this? Because it's so unbelievable. It's so wild. It's such a mis mystery that God could love you so much that he would send his son to pay, your, to pay for your crime. That Paul's simply saying, listen, don't lose the awe of what's happened to you. Real, real quick, is there anybody in the room who's been baptized in the last six months here at ACC? Where are you? I'm not going to call you up on stage or make you say anything. All right. So we got, we got a couple right here. A couple of baptisms. By the way, we've baptized more people at ACC so far this year than any year to date. It's incredible what God's doing here at ACC. So, John, I'm going to pick on you for just a moment. You don't have to say anything, I promise, okay? And so would you just do me a favor and just stand? Just let everyone see who I'm talking to. All right. So, John, you were baptized about a month, a half ago, six weeks, maybe seven weeks, eight weeks ago. Uh, awesome, right? But let me, let me think about this. If you guys all found out that John uh, played the lottery, uh, and by the way, this is not, I'm not advocating playing the lottery. Don't do it. Stupid. All right? Don't do that. But let's just say that John went out and decided to play uh, the Powerball, and we just found out last Tuesday his numbers hit, including the Powerball. And now he's, uh, he's got $500 million coming his way. And you found out, John wasn't secretive about it, so he's kind of telling people about it. And, and everyone, I, 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 seriously, when he would be walking into church, everyone would be whispering, like, that's the guy. The guy who won the Powerball goes to my church, right? And you'd be, you'd be looking, and, you, and all of you, you'd have a lot of new friends. I'm telling you, a lot of people would be shaking your hand and telling you about some bills they got going on. And you would be a pretty popular dude, and people would be excited for you. And think about that. That's just, you know, considering like $500 million. That's a lot of money, all right? And don't get me wrong. But there's a, something else that sometimes when we see enough people uh, w walk up this step and then down these steps and go into the waters of baptism, and they, they've given their life to Jesus, and they're saying in that moment, I now want to be a follower of Christ, and they, they're buried in the, the water of baptism to their old life, and they come up out of that water refreshed and saying, I, I'm a new person in Christ. I boldly proclaim it. Like what, what we're seeing in this process of someone give their life to Jesus and then boldly proclaim it in the waters of baptism is so much more exciting than someone winning $500 million dollars. Isn't it? Yes. John, you can sit down. I don't know why I made you stand up. I, but here's the deal. Like sometimes enough exciting things happen in a church, the way God's hand of blessing is on this church right now, that when someone gets baptized, just like, oh yeah, yep, that's just what we do around here. But at the same time, every time someone goes into the water of baptism and comes up out of the water boldly proclaiming that they made a decision to follow Christ. That's exciting stuff. 
That's something that we ought to be like talking about, the awe when, when Paul says to the church in Colossae, right, when he says, you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it and don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world. What he's simply saying is, don't let it lose its awe. Like the mystery of reconciliation. You didn't have to pay anything. Jesus paid it for you, which doesn't make any sense. Now again, I'm the kind of guy, I want to know what's the, the secret behind the trick. I don't want this to be a mystery. What is the, how does this illusion work? In this case, it's not an illusion at all, right? Corey Ten Boom says this, love is the strongest force in the world. If you're wanting to know how this how this works, what is the, the power behind this mystery? You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says this too, of all these things, what, what is the greatest? The greatest of all the things mentioned is love. Love is the strongest force in the world. Love, it says in the Bible that God is love. And so the, the, ultimately the secret here that's being revealed is that God's love is the revealed secret of reconciliation. God loves you so much that this mystery of reconciliation somehow makes sense. Here's the second mystery I want to talk about this morning. It's the mystery of satisfaction. The mystery of satisfaction. Like how is it possible for someone to be satisfied, to be okay with, to be even glad or, or rejoice when things aren't going the way that they want them to? It's really easy to be satisfied when everything's going your way. Right? When, when, when everything's going the way you want, when you just win $500 million in the Powerball, again, don't play the Powerball, it's a waste of money, right? Don't do it. But if everything's going your way, it's really easy to feel satisfied. But what happens when you're like Paul and you've been put in prison for proclaiming the gospel? When someone puts you in prison for something that they shouldn't be putting people in prison for and you're, you're persecuted, and here's the thing about the timeline of, of Paul's letters. I'm going to read to you a passage from 2 Corinthians. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it's going to show us some of the things that Paul has endured be, because of the gospel. 2 Corinthians was actually written before Colossians. So when Paul says what he's about to say in Colossians... I don't want to read it yet, but when Paul's about to say something in Colossians, I want you to know all these things in 2 Corinthians have already happened to him. Let's look at this list. He says that five times, that's five fingers, he's received the 40 lashes minus one. You might think, what is 40 lashes minus one? This is where they take a whip. It's called the cat of nine tails, has got nine little uh, mini whips at the end, little pieces of leather. And in those, they've, they've put glass and metal shards and things like that. So when they whip you with this thing, it sticks into your skin. And when they yank it back, it rips the flesh off with it. Five times has this happened to him. And the reason they call it a 40 lashes minus one is they believe that when you get whipped 40 times with this thing, you're surely going to die. So they stop at 39. They call it 40 minus one. And so five times has he been whipped 40 times minus one with this cat of nine tails. Why? Because he was proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. Three times he was beaten with rods. One time he was stoned and somehow survived. He lived through it. Three times Paul was shipwrecked. And he goes out of his way in this passage to say one of those times he spent 24 hours adrift by himself at sea, floating in the ocean. He experienced dangerous storms and he experienced dangerous people and robbers. There were times where he had no food or drink. He experienced extremely cold weather with not enough clothes to wear. He goes throughout this list in 1 Corinthians or in 2 uh, Corinthians 11 is where it's at. 2 Corinthians 11 is where this list is. And he expresses all these things that have happened to him. And now he's writing to this church in Colossae later. And here's what he says in verse 24. Remember, we're talking about the mystery 
of satisfaction. He says, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body. Is that a mystery to you? I've never had one time have I been beaten with rods. I've never been shipwrecked at sea. I've never had someone whip me with the cat of nine tails, not even just one lash. And yet here we have Paul, he's experienced all that for the sake of the gospel, and and he's talking about his suffering for, now he's in prison, that's the suffering he's in right now. He's in prison, and he says, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body. He's more than just satisfied. He's glad. To me, that's quite a mystery. Let's keep reading. It says in 24, it goes on. For I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message for you. He he talks about this idea of uh, being glad to suffer for them. I, I was reading out of the message paraphrase, this same passage. A paraphrase is where somebody takes... Uh, a, probably a valid translation or a, a translation of scripture and they kind of put it into some modern language and there's a, a paraphrase called the message and I really appreciated this wording think about it this way what Paul could be saying here is I want you to know how glad I am that it's me sitting here in prison instead of you In this paraphrase, it continues, when I became a servant in this church, I experienced this suffering as a sheer gift, God's way of helping me serve you, laying out the whole truth of the gospel to you. You see, Paul has figured out the answer to this mystery, this mystery of satisfaction. And I don't know about you, but I want to know what it is. Let me show you some other examples of this. In, in Romans, Paul's letter to Rome, he says in verse, uh, chapter 5, he says, we can rejoice too whenever we run into problems and trials. Paul says there's a way for all of us in this church to rejoice when we experience problems and trials. How about, uh, this isn't from Paul, but in the, uh, James's account of the gospel, It says, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. What? When troubles of any kind come your way, church, you're expected to consider it an opportunity for joy. How about, back to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Here's the the mystery. How do we find satisfaction in our circumstance, no matter what? How do we do that? And what Paul is kind enough to do in his letter to the church in Philippi is he talks about this secret in detail, and he gives us the answer. Here's what he says. In Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 11, it says, not that I was ever in need. Let's just pause right there for just a moment. He just, remember... He just laid out in in 2 Corinthians a lot of need. Can you imagine being in cold weather and robbers have just taken all your clothes? I don't know about you, but if I'm hungry and thirsty, I think about that as a need. I think, you know, I could really use some, I need some clothes, I need some food to eat. And Paul's perspective already is that he's never been in need. That's what he just said. Not that I have ever, that, that I was ever in need. For I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret. Will you guys say that phrase with me right there? I have learned the secret. Paul has discovered something that he now wants to write out to the church in Philippi and that he's now expressing to the church in Colossae, saying, listen, there's this secret of satisfaction. There's this mystery that I want to unfold. 
I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. What does he say is the secret to satisfaction? The secret is Christ. He can do everything with Christ. He recognizes that when he has Christ, he doesn't need anything else. Whether he's got a lot or a little, whether he's hungry or, or, or full, it doesn't matter because he's got Christ and that's the secret. If you really think about it, what he's saying is the secret is trust. He's learned how to trust God. God, if you have me in this situation, you must want me here. You must be using it. Maybe you're teaching me something. I trust that I'm in this situation and you are aware and that you're going to do something with it. And the other part of that too is reliance. It's this trust and reliance of saying, God, I, I rely on you. I don't need anything else. I don't technically have any need as long as I have Jesus. Here are some things that could come out of our mouth in a season of suffering or in a season of, of having everything. We can say things like this, God, I believe you're using this to help me appreciate your suffering. When you're going through a hard season, one of the things that Paul says here is that the suffering that he experiences is helping him have a greater appreciation for what Jesus did for him on the cross. Maybe another thing you could say is, I believe I am suffering so that other people don't have to. Right now, maybe you're experiencing some sort of persecution and you're thankful that the, the, the focus is on you in that persecution so it's not on someone else. Or maybe it's, God, I believe that you're growing me in endurance and strength. Right now, you're making me go through this season so that I can be a stronger person who can, who can endure through hardship. And you're strengthening me in this season. Or something all of us could say is something like this, God, I trust that you are allowing, fill in the blank, that you are allowing this thing in my life, that you're allowing this opportunity, you're allowing this moment, you're allowing this hardship. I trust that you are allowing this for a reason and that I can count on you to guide me through it. You see, you have a, a freedom, church. You have a choice in this matter to decide in every circumstance whether or not you are going to lean into satisfaction and contentment or whether or not you're going to choose to be discontent and upset and in want and in need. And Paul is simply saying to the church in Colossae, listen, I, I figured out the mystery of satisfaction. And his name's Jesus. Here's a third mystery. The third mystery is the mystery of occupation. The mystery of occupation. Now, you might be thinking when I say that word, the occupation means like a job, right? You, you, you get a job, that's your occupation. I mean occupation in a different way. Another definition for the word occupation is the act of holding or possessing a place, right? When you occupy a building, it means you, you live in it, that you're inside of it. And so there's this mystery that Paul it wants to talk about, this mystery of, of occupation. Let's look at it. In Colossians 1, verse 26, so the next verse, it says, This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. This message that he was just talking about. He's talking about this message of, of reconciliation, the good news of the gospel. He says this message has been, has been kept secret. There's something about this message that was kept secret for centuries and generations past, and it's now being revealed to God's people. I don't know about you, but when I hear a, 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 of a mystery, of a secret, right, I want to know the answer. So let's keep reading. It says in 27, for God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. He, go, he keeps going. This is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. Now let me explain what's going on here. You see, the, the church in Colossae, the Colossian people, they weren't Jewish people. They're Gentiles. 
the Gentiles are aware of the Jewish people, and they know in the Jewish tradition, right, yeah, throughout the Old Testament, God didn't occupy people. God lived amongst the Jewish people, and he lived amongst them inside their tabernacle or their temple. And inside that, in the Holy of Holies, that's where kind of God's presence would rest among men, amongst the Jewish people. And he says, now listen, there's this something that's being revealed, and I want you now to know as Gentile people that, that God no longer lives inside of a temple. He sent Jesus Christ his son, and when Jesus was on this earth, before he went back to the Father, Jesus said, it's better that I go, because when I go, I'm going to send something even better. He says, Jesus, I'm going to actually live in you through the person of the Holy Spirit. What this means is that anyone in this room who's a believer, if you've given your life to Christ, you've, you've professed with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Christ, Essentially, you have received this incredible gift of Jesus occupying you, living inside of you. We say, inviting Jesus into your heart. That's how we say it sometimes. What we're really doing is we're inviting the Holy Spirit to come live inside of us. We are a temple of God. And this is going to be quite a mysterious thing to a, a Gentile listener. Like, what do you mean? I understand now that I get to be invited into this relationship, but God lives inside of me. That's pretty incredible. Here, here's the fourth mystery. The fourth mystery is the mystery of unification. The mystery of unification. Now, before I read our last passage of Scripture... I want you to think about something that you're going to see in this passage beforehand, all right? So Paul's going to, he's going to write in this passage, he says something about these Colossian people. He says, most of you have never met me in person. This is the verse that we're going to read that, that highlights this truth, that for the most part, we don't believe that Paul ever actually visited the church that he helped to plant. He sent Timothy and Epaphras to go plant this church, but he never actually went there and met any of these people. He's writing to a church that he never actually went to. And we get that because he says, most of us, we've never met. And according to his missionary journey, we don't think he ever actually went there. And then he also talk, talks about another church called the church in Laodicea. And he highlights the truth that he's never met the people of Laodicea either. And in fact, we, we can infer that the people of Colossae have never met the people of Laodicea. They've never met. All right, so keep all that in mind as we read this passage. Let's pick up in verse 28. Paul says, So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the, the wisdom that God has given to us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. That is why I work and struggle so hard depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers whom have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. Let me read that last sentence again because I want us all to see it. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. He talks again about this mysterious plan, this, this mystery I want to talk about here of, of unification. He says, listen, the church in Laodicea, I've never met them. You guys there in Colossae, I've never met you. Paul's never been to 710 Aqua Heart Road to meet any of us. He's never met us. I've never met Paul. But he talks about this mystery of there's something that ties you together with people on the other side of the world who are also brothers and sisters in Christ whom you've never met and never will meet. That there's this strong tie of love that unifies you, that binds you together together. In a way, think about this. You have more in common with a brother or sister in Christ on the other side of the globe that you will never meet in your lifetime. 
than maybe you do as someone who lives in your own home that doesn't know Jesus. There's this strong tie, this unification that ties you together that's only available through Jesus. Through him living inside of you through the person of the Holy Spirit. So with all those four mysteries kind of out there, we, we're at this place where we ask the question, what now, God? What do we do as these secrets are, are explored and as these mysteries are explored? You know, there's something about mysteries. Oftentimes when there's a mystery, people want it to remain a mystery. They want people to not know the secret. You know, an illusionist on stage doesn't want you to walk away knowing how they, they pulled it off. They want it to remain a mystery. But the truth is that God revealed this book to us. This is his revelation to us. He, these are the things he wants us to know about him, the things he wants us to know about uh, Jesus. And, and so he revealed these things to us in his word because these things are no longer meant to be mysteries. He wants every single one of us in this room to know the secret. He wants us to know the secret to reconciliation. He wants us to know the secret to satisfaction. He wants us to know the secret to occupation. He wants us to know the secret to unification. And here it is. Y'all ready? Here it is. It's Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can reconcile you back to the Father. Jesus is enough. Jesus is the only one who can provide ultimate satisfaction in your life. You can try to add other things into the mix, but none of it's going to work because all you need is Jesus. Jesus is what you need to be satisfied. He provides this secret of occupation. We try to put all other things into our bodies, try to put other things in our minds. We try to fill our, to, to try to find meaning and purpose. But, but Paul says, listen, I got the mystery of occupation all figured out. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit, Jesus living inside of you. That's all you need. And boy, do I have the, the secret to this thing called unification. You know, the same spirit I'm going to give you, I'm going to put in everyone else. You guys are going to be tied together with strong ties of love that no one will be able to explain because you share in common this koinonia. You share in common the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. You have living inside of you. Jesus is the secret to these mysteries. Now, let me read, as you're thinking of what God might ask you to do next, let me read the last passage today, which is Colossians 2, verse 3. And here's what Paul says. He says, in him, that's Jesus, in Jesus lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see, Jesus is the secret. In him, he, he solves all these mysteries. But not only that, maybe, maybe a challenge for you is maybe you've got some questions or you've got some doubts. There's something going on in your life that you don't quite, can't make sense of and you, you just don't. Listen, I would encourage you to go to the place where all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge reside, Jesus. You got some questions, take them to Jesus. Scripture's really clear. In him lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Maybe that's what you need to do today is you're in this room and you're already a follower of Jesus and you're just struggling with some things. I would just tell you, I would find some time on your knees and take those questions to Jesus. He's got all the answers. But maybe you're in this room right now and you've been trying to solve these mysteries on your own. You've been trying to figure out how to be satisfied and nothing seems to work. You've been trying to figure out how to be reconciled uh, past your guilt and just recognizing some of the things in your past or you're just, you can't get over them and they're just, there's a brokenness that you feel and you know about. Maybe you're putting all sorts of stuff inside you that, that's, not, that's not working, not fixing anything. Maybe you're recognizing a disconnect from other people that, uh, and, and listen, Jesus is the treasure of all wisdom and knowledge. He's the in him like, like the answer. So maybe the thing you need to do today is say, I need to not keep living in this mystery of wondering because I, now I know the answer. I need Jesus. 
Jesus will be the answer that I need. And so if you're in this room and you need to give your life to Jesus today, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray. And then at the end of service, as all of you are dismissed, I'm just going to hang out up front. And if you want to give your life to Jesus today, would you come and find me and say, hey, I want to know more about Jesus. Maybe you're not sure yet about Jesus, but you just want some more information about Jesus. Come find me. I'd love to talk to you. Because in him lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this revelation you've given to us. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you've revealed things you want us to know about you. We recognize that you don't want the gospel to be a secret anymore. You've asked us as a church to take the good news out to the outermost parts of the earth, to proclaim it from mountaintops, to let everyone we can find know about your goodness. God, so help us not to keep these things as secrets, but to tell as many people as we can about your goodness. God, for anyone in this room that needs to start a relationship with you today, would you fully remove the blinders from their eyes, help them to see that the only answer that they're seeking can be found in you alone. And that today would be the day they they walk out of this building as a new creation. God, we love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.